joining us today. Uh, my name is Kwang Woo Kim. I'm the Dean and the Director of the Herberger Institute for Design in the Arts, and I am very pleased to be welcoming you to the first in a new series here that we are calling Creative Conversations. Uh, the purpose of this series is to bring back to ASU alums from, Herber from the schools in the Herberger Institute to talk to us about, uh, about their, their careers and the relationship, this is particularly important to me, the relationship between their studies at ASU and the path that they created in the professional world. So today we're very delighted to have our first uh, visitor, Hamilton Sterling, who is from the class of 1980 in the School of Music. And I'm going to read to you the introduction that I had asked Hamilton to uh, put together for me. Hamilton Sterling is a sound designer, sound editor, filmmaker, and musician who has worked on such Academy Award winning films as The Dark Knight and Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World, as well as War of the Worlds, which was nominated for Best Sound Editing. He recently cut sound on Terrence Malick's Tree of Life and To the Wonder, and has worked for P.T. Anderson, Christopher Guest, and Steven Spielberg. Hamilton recently released a record album soundscape with Grammy-winning artist Jimmy Haslip entitled Migration. He is the maker of an independent feature film, Faith of Our Fathers, which was the recipient of a 1993 American Film Institute Independent Film and Videomaker Grant. The film was selected to play the Los Angeles Independent Film Festival, the New York Anthology Film Archives, the Cinequest Festival, Santa Monica Film Festival, and the Cairo International Film Festival. Hamilton is a member of the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Recording Academy. Now, before we start our, our actual conversation, I also want to let you know that following today's conversation, which should end right around 6, and you will definitely have an opportunity to interact directly with Hamilton, um, we're moving to a second event, also featuring Hamilton and his work and his knowledge, which will be a screening of The Dark Knight in the new Marston Theater, which has just opened up in the newest building on this campus, which is the ISTB Interdisciplinary Science and Technology Building Number 4, which is on the other side of campus. We'll have a guide to walk people over who are interested in going. You'll be following a man with an umbrella. Um, the screening is part of a series that we call Hollywood Invades Tempe. So at 6.15 over there, there will be a reception. You'll have a chance to talk with Hamilton. There'll be food. And the screening itself will start at 6.45. So I hope that some of you after this will choose to join us for that second event. So Hamilton, welcome. Thank you. It's delightful to have you here. You. Um, why don't we start today by having you talk a little bit about your current work and what that, what that comprises? OK. Uh, well, I'm a sound editor uh, in Hollywood. I work on uh, studio films, and I work on independent uh, films as well. Um, I do sound design. I do sound supervision. I do mostly sound effects editing. Uh, and I've done that for about 26 years now. I think I've worked on about 80 feature films at this point in my career. And uh, <clears throat> that work comprises uh, all kinds of different sorts of things, mostly um, you know, st studying film, um, staying up to date with European kinds of film, um, and just trying to stay alive to the artistic process, I think, in, in all of its forms. Um, I think we were, we were talking earlier about the idea of having multiple um, interests when you're an undergraduate. And for, I went to uh, music school here. Um, I was a jazz major. And uh, that also comprised doing you know, uh, classical as well. And, I think the dipole between those two um, interests helped feed uh, my creativity and, and helped guide me toward you know, uh, the, the work that I presently do. Um, I would also say, though, that <clears throat> you, know, the, you can't underestimate the larger culture and the larger um, works that you know, reach the public. I mean, for me, when I was 10 years old, I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey <clears throat> at the Kachina Theater here. And it pretty much gave a huge direction to my life because it, it, it introduced me to modern classical music, uh, archaeology, cosmology, astronomy, filmmaking, all those kinds of things. And <clears throat> it's kind of been 
and the fact that a work of art can do that, um, I think is, can't be underestimated in terms of trying to find your way as an artist in, 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 in the most difficult you know, kind of work you can do, which is be an artist. And uh, so. So Hamilton, yeah. this is actually, maybe everybody here already has a really clear sense of this, but I don't really have a clear, clear sense of the idea of being you know, a sound editor at this level, you know, working with the kinds of directors that I mentioned. So we were just talking about Terrence Malick. Mm -hmm. So if you cut sound for Tree of Life, what does that actually mean in terms of your, your interaction with the sort of you know, creative genius behind the, behind the film? Where, where, what role do you play in that? How much do you participate in that? It depends on, it, it depends, you know, it, the, a sound crew is broken into multiple kinds of uh, jobs. There's a, usually a sound supervisor. Now they're called the sound designer. That's just a fancy word, really, for the sound supervisor who supervises the rest of the crew. It can be a dialogue editor, Foley editor, sound effects editor, ADR editor. And that kind of comprises the, the, what was, at least, in the, the, the general uh, idea of who uh, cuts sound on a film. So if I'm actually working as a sound supervisor, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be speaking with the director on a film. And we're going to go through every single scene, scene by scene. We're going to talk about it and discover, hopefully, together, Rather than as a, as a sort of a one way dictatorship, right. what you know, what we can bring uh, to the to the drama and to the ideas and the and the motifs, you know, that, that course throughout the film. Um, if if I'm working as a sound editor, I'm working under a uh, supervising sound editor, and then <clears throat> that job has actually quite you know changed a lot. Um, it used to be that this that the supervising sound editor chose all the sound effects, they picked the things that you needed to cut, and you know you worked your way through the film uh, uh, in that way. Now, because uh, the schedules are so, com so compressed, the technology has, has compressed both the schedule and, and compressed the manpower on a crew or person power on a crew, uh, <clears throat> that uh, it, the sound effects editor basically has to choose all the sound effects themselves, and they do a lot of the design themselves as well. So, it's it's all creative at this point, uh -huh. um, and the the you know the, the relationship between the boss and and the and the worker on the crew has pretty much been erased. Um, so, if I'm working you know with a director, as I said, it's one thing. If I'm working as a sound editor, it, it's it's hardly different at this point. Um, Have you had experience? I mean, I'm thinking now in terms of as a performer working with a composer, where the performer is trying to realize the composer's intentions, but sometimes what happens when you're working with a living composer is that because of an idea that you as a performer have, you actually change the way the composer thinks about his or her work. <clears throat> have you had that experience working with directors? I have. I, I just worked on an independent film, <clears throat> and there's a character in the film that may or not, may not be there. And yet, <clears throat> the the, the way it was shot and the way it was cut and, and the production sound that was you know accompanied to various scenes uh, was very concrete and uh, at the end of the film <clears throat> um, I had the idea that maybe when the character the gets shot and dies and falls there would be no sound as he fell to create that strange sense of well, was he really there or not and that was something that the director hadn't thought of and, but was just a logical sort of step from you know what, what the you know theme of the film was. Uh -huh. was. So there are the, uh, many many occasions that you know you bring your own. You can as an artist you can only bring your what you have inside you anyway. To ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, and you hope that 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 it fits the director's vision, and you can tailor things to some degree to try to fit the uh, uh, director's vision, and they'll pound you into submission if, if you don't. But <clears throat> for the most part, uh, you have to bring what's inside you. Um, cutting sound is, is, is really like composing, or as I have said s somewhere, like slow motion improvisation in a way. Mm. Because nice. You're, nice. <clears throat> you're creating something, and, and the sound is creating uh, a feeling in the audience. And Really, it's it's about you and what the, the capacities that you have to uh, the emotional capacity that you have to bring to mm -hmm. to a work, and uh, and I think that's 
you know, just that's part of the job. And it's also part of the, the, the f fulfilling part of the job. Right. You know, right. I, think I mean, yeah. Well, I, I think it's also important because for many of us, whether it's film or theater or music or any of the various art forms, it's easy to think in terms of a hierarchy of importance. So you think, well, this is the person who's really the creative voice that's determining what's happening, and everyone else is yeah. kind of fitting into place. And I think it's important for all of us to remember that these, pro these complicated collaborative projects require lots and lots of creative input, and, and it's important to own that piece, yeah. to not feel like you're just a cog in a machine, because otherwise the <clears> product <throat> is not what everybody wants. I think yeah. that's important. Yeah. And, and, at this, and at this point, the, the crews have shrunk to such a small uh, uh, you know, uh, degree that you do own it. It is you. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, OK, so let's, let's time travel backwards, back to your undergraduate days mm -hmm. at ASU. Um, you were already, by the time you came here, a very accomplished jazz performer. You were already, and it sounded from our previous conversation like you were very much on track for a while to really establish yourself in that career mm -hmm. as a performer. So mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about your studies here and also if there was a moment where somehow your, your interest in film, which is already there, just kind of pushed you, pushed you in the direction that you've ended up. Or what was going on for you as an undergrad? <clears throat> well, you know, I, was, I started playing gigs when I was a sophomore in, in, in high school with actually some of the professors here. And uh, so it was a pretty natural transition for me to, to end up here. Um, and I, I think, I, I guess it, it, it goes back to the emotional thing. I mean, jazz is a very emotional kind of universe, and I remember the first time, the, the very first performance that I had to give in front of all of my students, uh, you know, my colleagues, and fellow students, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> uh, I had learned that my father had died uh, at, you know, in the morning, and yet I had to perform that night in front of everybody. And I think it was the first time I really felt like I made this incredible connection between who I was as a person and what my art could communicate. Mm -hmm. And that, as well as the, as the, as of course all the classical, uh, you know, education and so forth was, you know, uh, informative of all of that. At the same time, I had this sort of outside obsession, which I think was a little controversial of my film obsession. Right. <clears throat> and I, I made a film actually over the three years that I was, that I was going to school here um, and getting my degree um, and shot it in the music building. As a matter of fact, Lewis Nash is a pretty famous jazz drummer who I played with through, through most of my uh, early years through, from high school through, through college, was the Dolly Grip in the music building during the, doing all these, uh, you know, uh, circular dollies around yeah. the, and down the corridors. But um, <clears throat> so that, all of these things I think were, you know, just informed uh, who I became. And, I, and we were also talking about the fact that, you know, you, you may be studying one thing and you may be obsessed with, with one particular thing, but it is the whole formative aspect of all of the, uh, of all of your experience which is going to guide you through um, your artistic career, which is a very zigzagging you know, uh, career. There is no straight path. And maybe there are straight paths in other, in, in, in other courses of study. But the path of the artist is always going to be difficult. There's always going to be obstacles. Uh, and, and you just you know, fight through it. And when you hit a brick wall, you, you know, turn, turn to the left, and you turn to the right, and you do whatever you know, you need to do in order to, you know, express yourself. It requires a certain ferocity of intention and purpose, because if you don't have that, um, those brick walls will stop you. So, and, you know. Hamilton, I mean, now this is interesting, because as a former music student myself, how, so how did you find a way as an undergrad to kind of break out of the mindset of if you're serious, well, and it may be a little bit different in jazz, but I don't think it is. How did you break out of that mindset of, well, if you're serious, you spend all of your time doing this one thing, and you just perfect that one thing. But you were spending a lot of time doing something else that was really important. Did, how did you make that work? How did you not sort of encounter people telling you you weren't serious enough? Or 
Well, maybe I was a little bit lucky in the sense that I was already performing and, mm -hmm. and probably, you know, uh, uh, at, that, at that time, but we're talking from 1976 to 1980, maybe, maybe a little bit of a big fish in a small pond uh -huh. kind of thing um, uh, here. Um, and yeah, I don't, that's a good question. I'm not exactly, not exactly sure about that. And when you made that first film, I mean, were you just basically working from instinct? Was it all yes. figuring things out as you went? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, I, you know, <clears throat> like going back to 2001, I probably had read the making of 2001, you know, 30 times by the time I got to college. So there, were, there weren't many, unlike today, which is pretty remarkable, both for musicians and filmmakers and everybody, the internet has so much uh, information. You, you know, you can gather so much information. And, and at, at that time, we didn't even know that there were modes to the melodic minor scale, you know. So it, yeah, it, it, uh, it's changed. It's really changed. And um, you have all the opportunity for all of that uh, food that will, you know, give you what you need to be um, to, and, and give you the resilience to m make all those course corrections that you kind of need to make if you're going to have a career in the arts. So you finished your BA. But made, but had this additional, very broad creative experience, which yeah. to me is really fascinating. I mean, I, I know that our students know this is something I, I worry about all the time. That I don't want our students to be overly condensed somehow yeah. by the time yeah. they leave. Then what happened? <clears throat> then, uh, well, but by, by the time I finished uh, college, I had made a 16 millimeter, 54 minute science fiction film, and uh, <clears throat> and took it over to L.A. to have it uh, answer printed. And um, uh, the timer actually on the film said, hey, this is pretty good. This is better than a lot of the films I see from USC students, which was the, which was the big deal. So uh, right. <clears throat> he said, you should take it over to this, th this guy. I know this guy who distributes films. So I went to this little, I, you know, you come from Arizona. I used to consider, you know, I was born here. And I used to consider it Borneo you know, because I felt like I was so outside of the universe that I kind of wanted to, to, to be a part of. Um, and uh, so I didn't know anything. I took the car. I drove to this, you know, mini mall. There was a strip joint here, and then there was this so-called film distributor here. <coughs> and uh, and uh, so I, you know, he said, "Well, let me show the, let, let me see the film, kid." So I, you know, carried my 16 millimeter projector in. I had my film in my hand, and and he said, "Well, I'll take, you know, it's pretty good. I don't quite understand it, but it's pretty good. I'll take it on." <coughs> this is the early '80s, uh, and you know. This is really dating me, but video cassettes were just sort of coming out, and okay. they, and, and he, they needed product, so <clears throat> um, so he put it together with a package with I think Abbott and Costello meet the Moon Women or something like that, <laughs> and sold it and sold it in Spain. So my film that I made here actually ended up on video cassette in Spain, whether it was dubbed or not, I have no idea. <laughs> wow. But um, that film then. Uh, and then I re then 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 the really pathetic thing is that I um, my wife and I moved to uh, my girlfriend at the time moved to San Francisco and I thought of course I've got a film I'm going to show up at ILM and and uh, you know they're going to hire me in an instant <clears throat> so I walked into ILM with my 60 millimeter film under my arm and my film projector and sat in the lobby and you know kept looking at my watch and nothing happened and nothing happened and then I had to walk out at the end of the day because you you know I think when you when you come from you know, it was a pretty rural place back then, in a, in a sense. You, yeah, know, you yeah. really don't know the, 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 how to operate in the world, you know? You don't know how it sort of works. <clears throat> and um, so, um, but anyway, a friend, I was, I was wor uh, working as an assistant on a, on a, on a little uh, jazz documentary, as a matter of fact, on Ernie Andrews, uh, by this time in LA. And a friend saw that film that I'd made here and said, gee, this sounds pretty good. And uh, I'm going to show this to a friend of mine. And he did, and then suddenly I was cutting uh, sound effects on uh, an Alan Rudolph film, Trouble in Mind, yeah. which is the first feature that I worked on. And I hadn't ever worked in 35 millimeter at that point, so I rented a 35 millimeter moviola and practiced for a week. I told him, of course, I could do it, <clears throat> and practiced for a week in, mm -hmm. in, the, in our kitchen uh, before I before I started the job, and that kind of was the. Was the, was the core, so it actually started here. Really. So that's interesting that you you found you sort of thought you were going this way, and then you kind of shifted over a little bit. And I'm curious about that moment 
Uh, was, that, was that a moment of <clears throat> disappointment for you, Hamilton? Did it feel like, oh, I'm not going to get to do what I really want to do? Or how did that feel in, when you realized maybe it's going to be editing sound? I, I think, you know, well, I was still determined. Even, you know, <clears throat> if you, at a certain point, you have to pay your rent. So, uh, and sound, because of my musical background, sure. was such a natural, yeah. uh, you know, thing um, that I think I was still very, very determined about making a feature film, which I eventually did. Which you did, did yeah. Um, <clears throat> at great cost, you know, um, $90,000 on credit cards and $50 in the bank, you know, wow. the classic story. Um, and, but again, I think it just takes a kind of ferocity um, if you really want to do it, you, I hate that story where people say, if you really want to do it, you'll be able to do it. That's not necessarily the case. I mean, chance plays a part. I had this film, somebody saw it, somebody else saw it, it you know, I got a job. Um, and, but I do believe that, that, that I would not have been able to make that feature film if, if I hadn't just had the absolute drive to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important, <clears throat> you know, it's, I'm going to be teaching this class, and I was thinking, you know, the next couple of days, and I was thinking about students and and how they approach the work and their lives, and <clears throat> and maybe it's completely unrealistic to think this way, but I thought, you know, every time you pick up that saxophone, every time you pick up that camera, <clears throat> you treat it as the moment where you just focus, and you do not. It's not, you know, there are no halfway measures. When you, when you pick up that instrument of expression, you focus and you do it for all it's worth. Mm. Because if you don't, you'll never, it won't mean anything to you and you won't be able to put, put, put yourself into it. Robert Schumann has a wonderful book of advice for young musicians, at, which of course, a couple hundred years ago. But uh, one of the most beautiful things he writes is, Every time you sit down at the piano, you must play as if there's a great master present. That yeah. same idea, you know, you can't fool around. You have to be there, yeah. serious, and, and it has to mean something. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah, sorry. We're, so this is always fascinating to me. I mean, the, we, it, the benefit of this conversation is I'm talking to someone who's very successful and who, you know, is, is hopefully working at the level that makes you feel like a success. But... When, when did you realize that might, I mean, when did sort of where you are now become clear to you that that's where you were heading? Or is it, you know, is it, has it been a process of planning? Has it been more a process of being surprised? I'm just curious how you see your own life that way. Hmm. I think the process of finding yourself and finding your place um, requires connection with other people. And if you do good work and you are sincere about your work and you are empathetic to your colleagues and to even empathetic to the fact that maybe, you're, maybe, maybe the film you're working on isn't so hot, maybe the director isn't very good, maybe he's failed, maybe, you know. But if you approach these things with a sense of empathy, I think you can find um, a meaning that's, that, that that um, progresses the culture and progresses it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it's nice. Yeah. Did, can you think of moments, Hamilton, where you felt that what you had to do to get through the next was to work through what felt like failure? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Can, can you share some of that? <clears throat> Let's see. Um, there, there was a, well, you know, there are moments of failure and there are moments of failure. I remember uh, a horrendous moment for me, uh, actually in the School of Music, um, when I had been shooting, and this is the problem of, 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 this, this is the problem of having more than one uh, interest and more than one obsession, but I was shooting that film that mm -hmm. I mentioned over here uh, in Encanto Park with a bunch of cops and different kinds of things, and somehow I'd convinced them to show up and do this. <clears throat> and uh, then I had to go, uh, play with Claire Fisher in the afternoon yeah. in front of an entire student body. I think it must have been, yeah, I think it was the entire music school. And uh, I won't tell this story because it's pretty dark. And if you want me to ask me about it later, I'll, I'll tell you. But, but, you know, there are humiliations, there are disappointments that, that you hit in various points of your, uh, of your career 
that, you know, you just have to work through. I mean, you look at Ingmar Bergman, half of his cinema is about humiliation, you know, and, and the humiliation of the artist. Um, you know, thinking of Sawdust and Tinsel, or, you know, or many, many of his films. And, you know, <clears throat> that's part of putting yourself out there. That's part of, you know, what you have to do. Um, and... Uh, where do you find that in yourself? Where, where do you find the, where the ability, that ability to move to, past yeah, it? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you just don't give up. You can't give up. I mean, if you give up, you just crawl away, and you can't do that. You know, you have to keep fighting. Um, and, you know, I still find myself fighting. You know, I'm 54 years old. The industry has really changed. And it gets harder and harder to get work, which I know is not what students want to hear, but it's the truth. And, you know, you just have to, you just have to keep working at the work. And if you actually enjoy what you're doing, you're going to, you're going to be doing it whether you're being paid or not. And you're going to be creating things that are interesting, that that will you take you in different directions. Like this uh, piece that I made with Jimmy Haslip, yeah. this soundscape piece, it's a uh -huh. six movement um, uh, kind of uh, programmatic narrative piece that I made. Uh, with him and we, we, we were together one day and he was in my studio and I was playing him some weird sounds that I'd made and he said that's pretty cool let's let's try to do something with that and I literally just started plugging in cables and we just started and a month later we had this I think pretty interesting piece and you know that was the direction that I had no idea was going to you know uh, go down and <clears throat> it wouldn't have been possible without my music knowledge. Mm -hmm, right. It would have been completely unsuccessful if it was just a bunch of sound effects stuck inside some sort of sure. musical composition, sure. which was a, a particular way of, you know, some people have actually done that. But um, yeah, so you never know, you know, what creative outlet you're going to find and, and uh, you just have to be open to it. Uh, you know, I was, I think we were talking before, the one thing I regret when I was here is that I never went to any dance concerts because I, uh, um, I just recently, actually, fairly recently in the last few years, have seen some, you know, dance performances mm -hmm. and never ever realized that the human body could express such profound concepts before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, I'm, especially as undergraduates, where you're experimenting and finding yourselves and finding the language of, of who you will become, um, that it's important, again, to experience as many different kinds of things as you can. Just fill yourselves up with as much as you possibly can. I know everybody has classes and, and they have to pass them and scholarships and things like that. But just try to, you've got the energy when you're young to fill That's your, right. to, 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 to go as hard out as you possibly can. And you just need to do it. What do you see now when you look into the future? <clears throat> That's a good question. I'd like to make another film. Uh -huh. um, I'd like to put myself through that again. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> um, that and uh, there are other kinds of po musical possibilities too that I just got a call from a kind of a music library that just called me out of the blue that heard migration and said, gee, would you be interested in doing some composing for this? So that was, you know, again, that's just one of those instances where, <clears throat> you know, a door suddenly opens that you've never even considered, you know. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, being an artist is a strange life, you mm -hmm. know. It's not a it's not a, a unidirectional sort of existence, and you just have to be open to as many different things as you can be. Uh, actually, my friend uh, Jimmy Haslip, who's the bass player with the Yellow Jackets, or was until just recently. I mean, that is his philosophy as a working musician. As a very successful working musician, traveled all the whole world. Uh, you know, he, as he says, throws as many things against the wall as he possibly can. To, to try to sustain that kind of a life, because um, I think it's just necessary, uh, especially especially in the digital realm where it gets harder and harder and harder to get revenue mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not only sustain yourself but to sustain your art. Hamilton, one more backwards-looking question, and then yeah. we're going to open it up for our <coughs> audience. Um, so, if, if you knew when you were an undergrad that you were going to be doing the work that you're doing now, and and working in the sort of milieu that you're working in, is there something that you would have added to your study, or, w or is there something that you wish we had offered as a university back then that you could have had access to that would have been helpful for you? <clears throat> I can't, well, there was no film program. Right. The only program, right. the, only, the only class that I took was Nick Salerno's classroom, who happen, uh, class who happens to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, he offered the only 
avenue. I'm not sure whether Nick actually programmed PBS or not and programmed all those great art films that, that I watched. But um, uh, I mean, now that you have a film department mm -hmm. um, and you have all and you know all of the departments of art, uh, you know, I can't really think of anything um, specifically that um, I think you just have to absorb as much as you can. Yeah. 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 I guess for me, I always wonder if if there's a way, you know. I'll, we're, we're exact contemporaries. I'm also 54. Mm -hmm. So um, when we were in school, the basic message about life after school was more, well, you learn what you learn in school, and then you'll figure it out when you get out into the world. You know, <coughs> the school of hard knocks, that idea. Yeah. And I know that's always going to be true, but I, I always wonder, as an, as an educator, isn't there a way that some of that can happen while students are still in school? Isn't there a way to sort of provide <coughs> some of those necessary skills and experiences so that so that it's not quite such a smack in the face when... Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I don't know how, I mean, I have, um, a, you know, Adam, Adam Collis was the one who helped, you, you know, uh, who we met and, and, uh, uh, and I'm not sure, we haven't really talked much about how, how much equipment is here, what kind of, um, you know, gear is here. Uh -huh. But I was thinking, you know, it would be in interesting to see whether or not students would want to form um, essentially sort of like a collective or a, co or a production company uh -huh. within, you know, multiple production companies. And if they, if they had to, you know, purchase some gear that they might need, they would be able to do that in a community kind of way where they could share the experiences with one another of all the different roles that are required, mm -hmm. for instance, to make a film. Um, and, you know, within that community and within all of those diverse personalities, you're going to have some hard knocks and you're going to have to get through it because all of your equipment, you know, everybody's going to want to be able to use the equipment and use, you know, um, uh, utilize each other's talents, um, you know, to make films. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so in a strange sort of way, I think that... Um, let me backtrack a second. We, as a musician and as a sound editor, we, I, you know, we spend our times in practice rooms and we spend our times in small rooms without a lot of human contact uh, in terms of connecting with, with a larger group of people. And I found that when I, except in an orchestra experience or, or something like that, <clears throat> I found when I was actually directing my film, I felt so happy because there was a there was there was a good sized crew mm -hmm. that I could interact with that that uh, you know I was a part of, and the dynamic of working with 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 a, a great number of people, um, all who are sort of monomaniacal about the task at hand, is sort of the school of hard knocks. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it. it uh, uh, well, I mean, in terms of like you know just human interaction, um, I can't really put my finger on a on a construction that that um, would sort of be career based. Really, I mean that really is you just kind of launch yourself out into the world and and you know and find your way. But learning to be good working with people, I think, is key. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I was my mother used to call me a clam because she said clams keep their shells closed. <clears throat> yeah. And I never talked to anyone. So, I mean, yeah. it was a hard, hard lesson for me to learn how to interact easily with people. Yeah. Let's, let's open yeah. this up. I know Jason has a microphone here. So who has a, a question that they'd like to ask Hamilton? Jason? Please. Thank you. So the end of the movies, you know, when, when the credits are coming down, near the end is always the music credits. Mm -hmm. And so there's a pretty long list usually, both classical, pop, rock, whatever. So what do you have to do with that, if anything? Or how do you, what's your role in that <coughs> aspect? Yeah, the, in <clears throat> my role, well, I'm not, I'm, I'm usually not part of the music credits on, on films. I'm, I'm uh, part of the sound credits on films. So I'm like a sound, sound effects editor or a sound, supervising sound editor or a sound designer or oh, something okay. like that. So that's me. I'm thinking more music and so you're talking sound. See, that's a whole different thing where I was coming from. And right, you right. What you're talking about. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very segregated, that, that world is very segregated. I mean, we only interact you know, with the music editor when we're on the mixing stage and, and, all, of, and all of the components are sort of coming together. Okay. Yeah. Wait, what was your instrument? Uh, bass. What's it? Bass. String bass? 
Both right. jazz, yeah, and electric. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I yeah. was trying to figure that out. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, since you sound design for a lot of um, films that are very, I guess, like visual based, mm -hmm. do you have any project that stands out to you as far as like one you're more proud of based on like the difficulty or something that you achieved from it? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of having worked on uh, the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford because that film has such a, has a great feel. It's, it, you know, it's got the it's got the feel that I love. You know, it's 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 kind of Malick like, it's kind of Tarkovsky like. Their takes are slow, the scenes are slow. There's an ability to build tension and in, in very interesting and very subtle ways. <clears throat> you know, it's not. I mean, the movie we're going to see tonight is more of a wham bang kind of kind of, kind of film. Uh, that film actually provides a lot a lot more texture to examine and to, and to create very, very subtle textures. I mean, and that, and that particular director was completely obsessive. He, uh, he, <laughs> he, would, he literally would go through every single background track and, and say, move that bird three frames. Wow. Move, you know, he was, you know, beyond, beyond I've ever seen before. He kept claiming that he had hearing problems and, and he couldn't hear certain frequencies. And, and that that was why he was so obsessive. But I think he was really obsessive because he was obsessive. So. Hi. Um, as a sound designer, what, what's kind of the process that you take to discover new sounds or at least find the right sound for the visual style that the director is going for? <clears throat> well, this is juvenile. My answer is juvenile and, ch and childish and childlike. But as Adam and I were walking out of the loading dock, where I'm going to be teaching the class, <clears throat> I found myself rapping on the giant dumpster and on the bars with my knuckles and just <clears throat> looking around at this environment and saying, gee, there's a lot of great s sound opportunities here. But if you had a contact mic and, a, and you know, could borrow a good mallet from your per percussion major friend, you know, you could, you could, I mean, you just gather what you can and you pull all of these sounds together into, you know, a library. And that library will, you know, represent who you are to a certain degree, what your tastes are, you know, what, what gives emotion to you. And, um, and it's fun, you know. And now we can do it with a little tiny recorder and a, and a, and a, and a contact mic from an from a, um, acoustic guitar. So it's, there's no excuse for not going out into the world and gathering as much of the world as you can. That's fascinating. So I have a question for both of you guys. Um, you were talking about it earlier. Um, how do you think the widespread availability of knowledge on the internet is going to affect upcoming musicians? Uh, I don't know. It's uh, the whole landscape is is in flux right now. <clears throat> I was I was just you know almost joking with Dean Kim that actually being able to perform may actually get you, you know, be able to, you'll be able to pay your rent. Performers may actually be able to do much better than, you know, recording artists and people who record for, you know, um, pe people actually out, go out and play gigs stand a better chance of actually making a living at this point, that I think, than, than anybody trying to create, um, you know, records or, or those kinds of things. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I mean, the. When, when Jimmy and I made Migration, we made it because we enjoyed making it. And, you know, it co didn't cost that much to make. Um, and then we put it out. And, of course, you know, I don't really know anything about the music business. So, you know, I had to learn, okay, I, now I'm a record label. You know, how do I do that? So <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I put it on CD Baby and all these different kinds of things. And then I saw that Spotify had picked it up. This is when Spotify was in Europe. <clears throat> and I noticed that instead of sp spending $10 to buy this so that maybe we could recoup the money that we, you know, cost to actually print the disc because it was a 5-1, it was a 5-1 recording and so that was much, was more expensive than just burning a CD. <clears throat> and, you know, spot I start seeing these numbers come back of three cents, you know, 10 plays, three cents. And Jimmy just reported recently on his BMI statement that um, migration 
streamed, I think, 2,500 times last quarter and made about three cents. <clears throat> so I'm afraid that the film world is going to end up in exactly the same place. And I don't know how any of us are going to be able to make a living. Um, hmm. uh, I really don't. It's, uh, it's scary. It's really scary. I mean, I'm hoping that there'll be some interesting models that begun that, 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 that hopefully someone here in the audience can, can you know, figure out so that we can actually tr make a living again um, d you know, uh, in the recording world. Because you know, for the kind of things that I'm interested in making, there are recordings. You know, they're, they're, they can't really be performed live because they have a lot of sound design and things like that. I mean, I suppose I could sample them. But um, uh, yeah, I don't, that's a, that, is the, that is the question of the day. And, and I don't have an answer, and I wish I did. And I have a sort of extension of what Hamilton is talking about. To me, the issue of access to so much stuff, whether it's information or something else, as well as access to so many um, tools that are easy to use, has created a, an, a, a huge amount of a huge amount of work. I think I would call it. Um, that is not necessarily the product of an individual's really thinking deeply about what it is they're trying to say or how they want to say it or whether what they've produced is really tightly aligned to those things just because it's easy. So for example, when I, when I meet someone who tells me they're a composer and I ask about it and I hear what they're doing is just taking stuff and recombining, which is very foreign to my generation and my way of thinking. It's not that I'm against that activity. I think it's wonderful that more people are experimenting with creative processes. I just wonder what it is. And so my concern is, because I'm sort of a stick in the mud about this, I still believe that artistic creation um, is in part the result of discipline and intention. Not just kind of random. Well, random, random is another theory, too. But, and so sometimes I worry that. What's happening is a lot of people are quickly assuming labels. You know, I'm a composer, I'm an artist, I'm a this, I'm a that, without really owning it, without understanding, as Hamilton said earlier, that you have to be obsessively focused if, if truly your intention is to define yourself by your creation. So I just wonder if our culture is allowing a lot of people to kind of have fun, which is a great thing, but to confuse that with what it, at least what I think, what it means to truly uh, be a composer or be a performer. And, I, you know, I'm, and I'm not only thinking in terms of classical music, which is my world, but just the nature of creation. So I think it's a really interesting moment because um, we see it in the academy as well, for example. We see a lot of young people who, because it's so normal to just find the information on the internet, manipulating that information seems a normal thing to do. And then you know you come into, con into direct conflict with the issue of plagiarism and you know whose work is it really? So it's an interesting moment for us when there's just so much easy access. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. <clears throat> it's um, I don't have an answer for that either. It's uh, there's a kind of there's a kind of quality now that this. Um, I think you need to, to be able to own an idea and own a direction. <clears throat> you know, I, I was talking to Dean Kim about, for instance, the, the French New Wave. <clears throat> Each one of those filmmakers, Elaine Rene, had studied Henri Bergson, you know, Godard studied Camus probably. They all had a focus that they were able to they, were, they, they took a philosophy and a way of looking at the world, and they decided to build a form around that philosophy and express that philosophy. And the great thing about that is, is that you're going to immediately start subverting what the general cultural paradigms are of, of the day. And that actually, I'm hoping that all of you will do that because I want to live in that culture. I want to live in that culture where I can turn a prism and see one person's view of the world and turn it again and see another person's view of the world. So that 
it enriches my life and, enrich, and enriches the culture. Um, and I think that takes a, a seriousness of intent. And it also, that, it also takes an in, interdisciplinary yeah. uh, a need, <clears throat> you know. If you can construct a film class that is paired with a particular, uh, with a philosophy class, and begin to think of well, let's see how would I actually, how would I actually put form to, mm -hmm. to this way of to this philosopher's way of looking at the world. Um, I think you start to really tear apart <clears throat> this this constant stuff that we now that you're talking about. That just it's just it's just a wash of stuff, and I think it's all borrowed, it's all, uh, you know, they call it postmodernism, but it's all borrowed from all these different kinds of things, and it, nobody owns it. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a direction, nobody has a feel for the, the, the purpose of it. And I think you have to, you have to start at the beginning and, and, and create, you know, from that. There's a, there's a book I read a while back called The, the, the Clockwork Muse, and uh, the, the thesis of the book was that, uh, Art begins with an emotion, a form is put around it, whatever it is, you know, uh, poetry, film, music, whatever it is. <clears throat> and the next artist looks at that form and says, um, I want to make this a little more complicated and a little more cool, so I'm going to do this. And then the next artist looks at it and it looks at it and looks at it and it builds and builds and builds and builds until you end up with this construction that is very Baroque and probably has lost the original feeling and the original intent that, that began you know, in the, at the beginning of the process. And then it all just crumbles because then, of course, it doesn't connect with anybody, and so who cares? And then it starts again. And I think, Interesting. And I think that that, I, I, just looking around at the way the world works and the way that art works, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. And, I, and I, so I go back again to find Find the things that matter to you. Find, even if it's just an experiment, you know. Even if you don't, you know. You know, if you want to study, you know, Camus, find a way to express that, you know, um, because then, you know, you're, you're you're tearing apart the the paradigms of this corporate culture, which is just going to produce more and more and more junk that feeds nobody anything and does not advance the culture at all. It's just a money-making machine, and that's all it is, and now I'm on my soapbox. And no, but this message, I think, is really important for our students who are here, the idea, because we actually don't, hearing you say that, I realize we don't actually don't talk about this very much here, or we don't talk about it enough. The idea that what you're, what you're doing in, through your work, through your creative practice, actually is building the culture of, you know, of our time, of the future, we, you know, sometimes maybe get trapped too much in the idea of the specific work that you're developing, but, but there is a, a cumulative whole that equals the culture, and it's one of the reasons why we exist, why a place like the Herberger Institute exists, because if we don't own this, if we don't take charge of that process, what do we have? I mean, I think that's really powerful to think that way. Yeah. I'm going to find a way to yeah. incorporate that into uh, how we talk about ourselves. Another question for Hamilton, maybe? When you first look over, sorry, when you first look over the footage with the director or um, your sound team, what are the first, what is the first question or questions you ask yourself and possibly what question do you think us as student filmmakers should ask ourselves when approaching sound? <clears throat> the first question I ask myself is how am I going to do this? H how am I going to actually accomplish this? Because it, ne it never, that never changes. When I, when I start a, uh, a film, I ne I, I'm, I'm in a panic. I, you know, I've done 80 feature films, and I still feel like I'm, I'm starting the very first one, and I have, I have no idea how I'm going to accomplish it. Um, I, I would think, at least in terms of students, um, that, and what I'm going to try to do in the class, and you, who, uh, students will have to help me do this, but <clears throat> the most beneficial thing for you, <clears throat> as I talk about what I'm going to talk about, is to keep asking me, well, how would I do that? How, you know, how, how would I accomplish that with the with potentially limited means, with whatever I've got to work with? And I think that that, that would be a benefit to you. Um, uh, and I will try to do that. So. All right. Um, right here, right here. 
Um, so I actually have a few questions and I wrote them down because I didn't want to forget them. Um, so my first question is what other profession, if you were to choose any, like just one other, prof what other profession, if you were to choose one profession other than the one that you have right now, what would you want to do if you had any choice? I think I'd like to be an astronomer. Really? Yeah, cool. Is there any reason for that or just thought it's interesting or? Uh, it's just, you know, <clears throat> um, you never, you never get the final, maybe it's like art in a way and, you know, um, yeah. you never get the final answer really. Um, it's always a process of understanding and a process of knowledge, you know, as science is. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, that's just cool. Yeah, it's very cool, I agree. Um, so, w as a sound editor, um, you obviously watch other films, or just being a human being, really. Um, what is your favorite movie, if you had one for sound? Like, if, like if you're li listening to another movie, what would it be one that you would pick? That's, that's actually difficult because there's so many yeah. interesting kinds of, um, well, th there's as many in interesting soundtracks as there are interesting filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So it becomes really difficult. I mean, I like certain things, you know, for certain, ef certain effects. I mean, I like, I like uh, David Lynch's soundtracks enormously because they're this strange, internal, very musical, um, uh, you know, soundscape. Pardon me. And that's... Uh, I, you know, that's really interesting. But then I also like the soundtracks of Godard's films because they break, they break the whole paradigm. And I'll be, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that and, yeah. the, and the uses of that. Um, you know, I'm proud of the work that I did on Master and Commander, Certainly. Um, uh, the Peter Weir film. I'm very proud of that. Um, that, was a, that was a huge um, job, and, and, uh, and I cut a lot of sound on it. And I think it turned out really well, and um, I, I like I like that track. It's a great. It's a awesome. If I say so myself, it's, yeah. a, it's a great sounding track. Awesome. <laughs> um, my last question is: What has been the most challenging obstacle you faced uh, throughout your career? What, what would you say would be like the most <clears throat> difficult one that you've ever come to? It's specifically in terms of like trying to design a specific sound effect. Yeah, or? I would I would say like I mean. Anything that you would be thinking of, not like how you got to like where you are today, but kind of like what would be the more, more most difficult thing you could think of in terms of like getting the uh, feeling or getting the vision or the sound that you wanted. That's interesting. Um, hmm. I don't. You know, not, nothing actually comes to mind. Yeah, maybe it doesn't come to mind because it's a process. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, when you start you may not get it right the first time. You may not find it at first. And that, and, and, but you keep adding and subtracting and building and thinking and, and structuring and, and, and molding it until it finally is what is, you know, hopefully it's satisfying to you and, hope, and it, it better satisfy the director because, you know, you won't be hired again. But uh, so it, that's hard to describe because I, you know, it's a it's a process. I mean, I didn't actually have to design this, but I was I was on the crew of War of the Worlds, and the ula, the sound of the uh, that the machines sort of call out their call was a giant problem that went on for months and months and months and months. And um, I'm glad that I didn't have to. I played around with it and never, and did not come up with with the sound that uh, pleased Spielberg. It ended up being a didgeridoo. Grossly really? manipulated. Interesting. Yeah, <clears throat> but um, that's that's an instance where it was a really tough, you know, that that was a tough road. Let's take one last question, and then we we're going to adjourn over to the theater. And as I said, there will be a reception, so you'll have a chance to interact a little bit more with Hamilton. Who has uh, a, a final uh, question for hello. us? Hello. Hi. Uh, right here. Great. Um, I was interested or curious about the um, the interaction or the collaboration that you have with the director or um, I guess those that are uh, principal or majority say for the films, uh, the visual aspect of the film and the, and the sound design. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to know if there was a, if you can remember a director or a project that you felt you clearly were able to advocate or have your vision fully accomplished in a film. <clears throat> Boy, those are good questions. Um, I guess I'll start with the, the last one first. <clears throat> um, 
I would, I would say that uh, Master and Commander, I mean, I, I, one of the scenes that I cut in that film was the storm scene. And <clears throat> I worked on that for six weeks um, as the scene would change and change and change and change. Um, it was all visual effects. It was shot actually um, uh, live visual effects. I think they actually sent a boat around Cape Horn to get the storm, oh. storm waves. And then they layered all of those actual waves instead of digi digitized waves um, you know, to create the visual of that. <clears throat> but the first time that I started the process of cutting the sound for the scene, I found uh, this interesting kind of rhythm that I really liked and that it, just, it felt right to me. And so th through that whole process of all the changes that went on because of the visual effects, I kept that, I tried to keep that rhythm and instead of just, you know, we call it conform, conforming the material to fit the picture, I mean, if they lost a foot or lost, you know, two feet or whatever, whatever lopped out of a shot, <clears throat> I would try to reimagine the, the, the sequence again uh, to try to find the power in it again. Um, and so I think that was something that I was pretty happy that I realized. And what was the first part of your question? Oh, oh how, how to... How, how, how do the collaboration, how yeah. the collaboration works? <clears throat> that, you know, that changes from film to film. It's always different. Um, some directors are very specific about um, talking to you. Others, you know, just assume that you're going to sort of pull it out of thin air and then you have to pull it out of thin air. Uh, it really does, you know, change. And it seems like the, the directors now are so, um, the, the frightening thing actually <clears throat> is that um, there's a base of cliches now in terms of sound editing mm -hmm. that, um, that people expect and you hope that they're not going to ask for them. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, that, uh, that's a little, that, that can be a real touchy kind of situation. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that sometimes directors um, see other people's films and they want that kind of a soundtrack or they want that or they want this and so th that doesn't become quite so you know creative it's at the end of the day it really is the director's vision that's that's going to allow you to push as far out as you might want to go and um, uh, because you know it's their film and they have to they have to feel what, and they're expressing themselves and they have to feel what they need to feel uh, out of each scene and out of the out of the whole so um, yeah, but it's always different. All right, well, I think we're going to bring this to a close and move over to the Marston Theater. Hamilton, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. thank you for joining us. And as I said, there will be a guide to take people who are coming over with us. Uh, thank you. This has been wonderful. And thank you for your participation.